You know, the great privilege we have as believers is in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our saving hope, and it is the saving hope of the lost world. And whenever somebody accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, regardless of whatever age it is, we're commanded to obey Christ and follow in baptism. If you're new to the Baptist church, you may have seen baptism in other denominations in some other form. And as we come today, you might say, oh, that's the Baptist doing the old dunking. Well, it's actually called immersion. And it's probably the most biblical way of baptism because in the ancient days, they would have gone into the river and they would have completely submerged themselves as a visual cleansing, not a spiritual cleansing, but as a visual way of representing the cleansing of their sin that Christ has done in their heart through salvation. But when we get baptized, it's a testimony. It's telling the world that we are here as Christians, not as ourself, but as those that belong to Christ. And in the ancient world, getting baptized often carried consequences. In our country, we are afforded to be able to come to worship, be baptized, and not have to worry about facing consequences out in the lost world. It's our privilege today to welcome two into the family of faith and to testify to that through the ordinance of baptism. Reed, come on in. This is Reed Holloman. And his dad, Ken, is going to be baptizing him this morning. Not too long ago, I had the privilege of sitting down with Reed and sharing with him the gospel. And he had already accepted Christ, so I was just affirming what had already taken place in his life. And we talked about baptism, and he indeed wanted to follow in the footsteps of Christ. Reed, before these witnesses today, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, sir. Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Yes, sir. And do you desire to live for him for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. Amen. Well, then, it's my privilege to let your dad baptize you. Ready? Bab buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. All right. Come on, Samuel. This is Samuel Shaw. Hop up here where all your friends can see you, buddy. And this is his granddad, John. John Shaw's retired from the pastorate, but he comes today to carry on the legacy of baptizing family. And we're proud, proud to have John with us. Samuel, likewise, when I talk to Reed, let me ask you these same questions. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, sir. Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Yes, sir. And is it your desire to live for him for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. Well then, my brother, it's our privilege to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, John. Now, these two uh, gentlemen were younger, but we have seen teenagers walk through the waters of baptism. We've seen adults walk through the water of baptism. There is no age threshold on when it's appropriate to get baptized. It's appropriate when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you've never done that today, throughout our singing and throughout our worship, our preaching, we're going to share what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you are a Christian, but you've never walked through the waters of baptism, maybe the Lord will lead you through the testimony of these two young men to follow in the footsteps of Christ as well. And we can plan in some future date for you to be baptized. But what a privilege it is to join in our brothers in their testimony of baptism. Let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, as we sing about raising a hallelujah, what greater hallelujah is there than witnessing the testimony of baptism between two that have professed you as Savior? And we don't have to worry about our eternal consequence of sin anymore. And I thank you that they don't have to worry about it either. So Father, today we just praise you and we thank you. But we know that in our midst, maybe watching online, there may be someone who's never followed you in salvation. The circumstances of their life might be such that today they're open to that gospel. And we pray that you attend to their heart. And at the right time, that they would decide to follow you. 
Father, we thank you. And we praise you for who you are and what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, church. Yeah. 
Aren't you glad that our, our God is not an ever-changing God, but that he's forever faithful? You know, that kind of consistency with the Father is what allows us to not have to worry about life and the things of life. So I'm thankful, and I want you to be thankful too, that our God is a consistent God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if that's true, and it is, but if we believe that's true, then we have to approach the scripture with that same level of understanding. So the teachings that Jesus gave back then would be just as uh, applicable today. Uh, They don't change. There's not a new set of teachings because we're a different generation. There's not a a new word that needs to come because we're 2,000 years on the other side of the life of Christ on earth. Uh, No, it's the same teachings. So today we approach God's word. And the message that we are going to look at is one that's very familiar if you've been in church for more than a day or two. And uh, and it's, who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? Uh, Because Jesus talks about this in the Gospels. And uh, he calls us into breaking stereotypes and breaking out of our paradigms of thinking to consider that maybe there's more to somebody being a neighbor than just the person that lives next door to you. That's like what we call a neighbor, isn't it? The people that live on the left and right of us or across the street from us. But from a biblical perspective, a neighbor is so much more. Uh, to help introduce this broader topic, I want to show a video. Uh, I had the privilege some uh, months back to have on our campus some missionaries from the country of Zambia. They work with Possibilities Abound and uh it was a privilege to sit up here on the stage and sort of interview them for the work that they are doing over in Zambia and how our church can partner with them moving forward. Now, you might say, how does this tie in with the subject of, of who's our neighbor? Well, what we're going to learn today is that our neighbor is pretty much everybody in the world. So let's look at this video and see what God's doing on the other side of the world, so many, many hours away, and let's begin to pray about how we can minister to our neighbors over there in the context of what's going on. Introducing to you Delbert and Sandy Groves. They're missionaries to the country of Zambia. That's on the continent of Africa. And they are here to share with us a little bit about what the Lord is using them to do in that part of the world and to inspire us and help us think about how we can partner with them. Welcome, guys. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. to be here. Well, the organization is called the New Life Zambia or New Life International Mission is the actual 301. We're involved with all kinds of different outreaches from developing churches and congregations, to doing medical things, to working with the disabled and handicapped, to education and helping children with scholarships and orphanages and feeding programs. Some of the big ones that we, are this, that we work closely with most more than the others, uh, Sandy's deeply involved with education and working with uh, helping with health and education and training. I work closely with our pastors and helping them stay encouraged and focused on their life and their ministries. Uh, when we started in Zambia, uh, 20 some years ago, we had like five congregations in the, in the, in the country and there's well over a hundred or so. One, one of our other ministries, which is really important is the, uh, working with the disabled people that have lost the use of their legs for mobility. And we've been involved with that ministry that's called the pet ministry, personal energy transportation. It's an acronym pet. And it's just an outreach of where we physically build a wheelchair tricycle, if you will, you pedal it with your hands. And uh, it, uh, and we give these free of charge. We raise the funding for them, but then we give it. We find the people locally and give it to them and uh, help them give them mobility. But my first love is always getting in the community and teaching and training others how to have um, a better lifestyle. Whether it's better water, whether it's uh, you know just being able to avoid diseases and things that are very common. So we're able to get them into a school. We weren't even having them pass a grade nine exam or a grade 12 exam. So we started extra lessons to help them pass these exams. And it's been such a success story. If people from First Marion were to get on an airplane and fly all the way to Zambia, and they get off that airplane for a mission trip, what would that that mission trip look like? What are some of the things that, that they could expect? It's Bible camps. Right, Bible camps. Yeah, we have a lot of people that come in and, and work with that. And um, it takes a lot of work. You know, you got a hundred kids. Wow. And at one time, and they're sleeping on campus because we have the facilities for them to sleep there. And 
you know, it's it's so much fun, but it's so much work. Yeah, First Mary, and we got a lot of teachers in our congregation. That's right. So we might be able to put your skill set into work there in the country of Zambia. And we've also got some medical professionals that are a part of our church. And if we were able to uh, coordinate a medical component to the mission trip, what, what does that look like in the past when people have done that? Giving shots, checking temperatures and blood pressures, pulling teeth. Uh, I don't know. I've never done a medical mission trip. What we find is 90% of what's happening with these kids is preventable. Wow. So then that ties back into community health education. Yes. So we have trained community health educators that will then go in and do follow-up training and teaching on those circle. specific things. Yes, yes. Going on well. And the thing that I love about community health education, it ties in the the gospel. That's awesome. And I'm so de delighted to have y'all with us here at First Marion, and we look forward to more partnerships and more involvement with the work that God's given you to do. Uh, and. We're just going to just be praying to see what God can do. There you Amen. Go. That's all Amen. we can do. Thank That's you. all he calls us to Mary, do. I want you to be praying. Our goal is in 2024 to do a mission trip to Zambia to, to partner and, and see what God can do between First Marion and Zambia. I always get this wrong. New Life Center. New Life Center in Zambia. Right. I always get that wrong. Just call it New Life Zambia. New Life that, That's the website. NewLifeZambia.org and you'll find us there. Come on, folks. We have we have stuff for you to do. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So you can go to that website and you can check it out yourself. But I want some of you to begin praying right now to join us next year uh, in the middle of the summer. Don't have the exact dates yet. I should know in the next few weeks. And I don't want you to go. I want you to be a part of this. Uh, this will be the first time our church has done a uh, church-wide mission trip uh, to the to the country of Zambia. And we need you. We need your skill set. Whatever that is, I know that God will put it uh, to work over in Zambia. So let's kind of back up a little bit. And let's read some passages out of Luke's gospel. And let's see what Jesus said about being a neighbor. Let's see how his teachings can ultimately lead us to a prayerful state about a mission trip to another country. I'm in Luke's gospel, chapter 10. Luke's gospel, chapter 10. I'm, I'm going to begin reading in verse uh, 25. Now, the context of this story is that Jesus is being questioned uh, by some religious leaders. And what they're doing is they're trying to uh, trap Jesus. And as a part of that entrapment uh, that they're trying to do, they're, they're going to try to back him in a corner and get him to make a, a statement that they can use against him uh, to somehow get him uh, charged up with something and get him out of the ministry field. Uh, so all of this starts out as an entrapment, but Jesus, the masterful uh, guy that he is, turns it all, all, all around on them. So verse 25, chapter 10, Luke's gospel, here's what it says. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Oh, those lawyers. Those, Got to watch those lawyers. Uh, that, that lawyer, by the way, is not like you think of a lawyer today. Uh, in that day and time, when it talks about a lawyer in the text, it's talking about somebody that was an expert in the law, the biblical law that they would have had or the Old Testament law. And so that's, that's, uh, that's why this guy is stepping forward. Uh, he's supposed to be the expert. He knows all of the Old Testament law, what we would call the Old Testament laws. So if anybody is able to uh, trap Jesus in a misstatement about the law, it should be a law expert or a lawyer as it's in the text. He said, teacher, referring to Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So Jesus turns it around. He answers the question with the question and tries to draw out from this guy his thinking. Verse 27. And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Notice that the guy didn't ask how to love the Lord your God. Uh, because that's kind of summed up there, doesn't it? It's, it's ultimately that you love the Lord your God with your, with your whole self or with all of yourself. And just be specific with your heart, your soul, your mind. But the question is, who's your neighbor? That's the one that was open for interpretation. 
Let's see what Jesus says. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers and stripped, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came uh, to that place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Which of these three, Jesus asked, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the guy said, the one who showed mercy. Notice he didn't identify him as a Samaritan. We'll talk why in just a moment. But he talks about the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The Greek word that's used for neighbor in the text has three different aspects to it that help us understand who our neighbor truly is. Again, loving the Lord our God with our whole self, that's easy because the text defines it for us with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. But to just say love your neighbor, it's open for interpretation. But when we look at that little word in the Greek language, we see three reflections or three aspects to that word. The first aspect are those that are close to you. Those that are close to you. Now, I'm not talking about the man and woman that live on the right side of your home. I'm talking about much closer than that. We have to think familial. We have to think mom and dad and brother and sister and son and daughter. So let's just think in terms of our family context. We could also include close friends and extended family. But it's people that are close to us. Now, how do you know if somebody is close to you? Well, they're close to you if, uh, if you treat them like you shouldn't treat them. And you know better than to do that. You know what I'm talking about. You yell at people because you, you know they, they're family. They can't hate your guts, right? That's how we think about this. I told my wife, I've got a new definition of children, a new definition of children. It's other human beings that you can be, be both extremely proud of and pissed off at at the same time. That's my, I know I shouldn't have said it that way, but that's just the only way I know how to say it. That's, that's my definition of children. At the same time, you can be so proud and so mad. That's close. That's how you know somebody's close to you. Or you treat them in ways that you know you shouldn't and you get away with it because they're close to you. They're family or they're close friends. Part of the word that Jesus uses here uh, for our neighbor has this aspect of those that are being so close to us. Even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that there's no challenge in loving when those we love are our families or our close friends. And so often we think that loving those family and close friends, well, that's easy. Well, most of the time it's easy. There's a few outlaws in our family maybe that's hard to love. But it is, as a general rule, easy to love those that are close to us, our family and friends. We tolerate their bad behavior or their harsh words. We tolerate their misdeeds because they're family. And where we would not give other people near as much rope We'll give those close to us a lot of rope and discretion. And we'll put up with a lot from them. But when we consider them as our neighbor, and we look at the teachings of Jesus about how we should treat our neighbor, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, boy, it begins to shine a new light on how we treat those close to us. Another aspect of this word in the Greek language is not just those that are close to us, but it's, it's those that are other believers around us. Not just those in our community like our next door neighbors in, in terms of houses, but think in terms of believers. So that means those of you over on this side of the church, your, your neighbors are people that are on this side of the church. But sometimes as Christians, we don't treat each other very neighborly, do we? 
There's an old saying that goes around that says that nobody shoots their wounded quite like Christians do. And we do that, don't we? We, we know we're not supposed to talk about people. We know that we're not supposed to degrade other people. But it seems like when it comes to Christians, man, we just can't wait to spill the tea on what's going on in somebody else's life. And we'll label them and we'll categorize them and we'll ostracize them. And, you know, when we think about what Jesus says about neighbors and who's our neighbor, part of a neighbor is other believing people in the community of faith. This week, I'm going to be down at the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, They're gearing up for another big uh, round of uh, debates at uh, the convention this year. And I have no doubts that amongst the crowd will be many reporters and they're going to be looking for opportunities to take what the Southern Baptist Convention is deciding or saying and twist it and turn it and put it out there and there's going to be opportunities for that because some of what the Southern Baptist Convention is going to talk about this year is going to be directly related to other people in our convention specific people in our convention and whether or not to continue associating with them or not and to the outside unbelieving world it's going to appear and I hope it's not this way I hope it's just an appearance that we are shooting our wounded as Christians. Jesus said that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, and that means other believers. Now, we think of in terms of believers in this room, but let's take it outside of this room. What about, what about our brothers and sisters down the street at the Methodist church? Are they our neighbors? Well, sure, if we use this context of other believers. What about, what about the Presbyterian church down in West Memphis? Yeah, they're our neighbors too. And so there's a, there's a question that I think is fair to ask. How can we have agreement amongst ourselves as believers when in different denominations we have so much uh, that is not in common? We have a lot that is in common, but sometimes our practices are a little different and those practices can become sources of contention between us, just like our mode of baptism. Uh, you get three or four people in a room of different denominations talking about baptism and man, we'll go to the mat. Sprinkle, pour, dunk, however you want to talk about it. And we'll get fervent about it. But when the sun sets, they're still our neighbor. And Jesus would say that we should treat them as we want to be treated. So I, I wonder today, have you been praying for our brothers and sisters, our neighbors in the Methodist church. They're going through a really tough time right now as a convention. They're really struggling with some issues that maybe in the Baptist church we aren't necessarily talking about. But at their phase of life and their season, it's a big issue. Somebody told me that our brothers and sisters just down the street today are having some kind of big vote where maybe some of the people in that congregation may end up leaving because of the direction the church wants to go in their affiliation but have we been praying for them or have we just been talking about them have we been telling them hey none of your conversations and debates affect how Jesus loves you or the other people in your church you see when Jesus said that we should love our neighbor. He wasn't just talking about our close family and friends. He was also talking about other believers. Now, in this particular story that Jesus tells about the travelers, that parable, there are two very religious people that are mentioned there, the priest and the Levite. And if anybody, anybody should have shown mercy to the man who was beaten, it should have been them. The road that, they, that this parable occurred, it's believed was the main thoroughfare that came into Jerusalem where travelers coming to the temple to worship would have traveled on. Now, we don't know for certain, but if that's true, then could it be that in the context of this story, Jesus is talking about a man who was coming into Jerusalem to worship, or coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, having just worshiped the Lord. And these two religious people the priest and the Levite walk by and leave their neighbor laying in the ditch. Who is our neighbor? Is it just those that are our family and friends, those that we agree with and get along with and, and that we're blood with? 
Or is it also other believers, maybe if they don't believe just exactly like we do? The third aspect of this word in the Greek language is much broader. In fact, it takes an exponential leap backwards from going from just right around you to those in your faith community to considering the context of the entire world. And this is where the Zambia people come in. The people of the whole world are our neighbors. That's everybody. That's every race. That's every religion. That's every color and creed. That's if they agree with us politically or if they don't. And look, I'm a realist. I know even in the United States, we can't even get along with each other politically, right? We got Democrats and Republicans that are fighting at each other and the independents are just standing in the middle trying to watch. How in the world are we going to love those outside of our country that agree with us polit- differently politically, socially, or any other way? But this word in its broader context, which is the broadest context in which Jesus was using it, is that our neighbor is everyone in the world, the moment you became a Christian, you left the right of anonymity behind and everyone became your neighbor. There's a story of the founder of the Salvation, or the mother of the Salvation Army, Catherine Booth. She was speaking one night in a city and when she got done there was a lady that invited her over to her house for some tea and as they were sitting there the the lady who was uh, the owner of the house she said Miss Booth I got to tell you I was I was in your meeting tonight and I really enjoyed what you had to say but I looked around at the people that had come to hear you and I was just flabbergasted did you see them she goes well I don't know what you mean she goes oh well I was looking at the faces they were so terrible and they, they just you could tell that they were just so sin ridden people and I just felt I I don't even know if I can sleep tonight. I was so moved and disturbed by what I saw in the people that were in the room. And Miss Booth looked at her and she said, well, ma'am, I didn't bring them with me from my city. So they must be from around here, your neighbors. Ooh, pull the knife out, Miss Booth. The whole world is our neighbor. We teach our children this, but somewhere in our teenage years, we forget it. By the time adulthood comes along, it's a memory long gone. This is how we used to teach our children. I have no idea if this is politically correct anymore, but I'm going to do it anyway. Jesus loves the little children. All the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Sing it with me. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Do you know those children? They grow up to be adults. And those adults need Jesus. And Jesus loves those adults just like he loves those little children. So whether it's down the street, whether it's a community around the corner, on the other side of the state or country or whether they speak a different language and they live under a different flag. Jesus says, I love them and I died for them and they are your neighbor. So treat them the way you want to be treated. And how do we want to be treated? I don't know about you, but I want to be treated with respect. I want to be treated with love. If I'm thirsty, I'd like a cup of clean water. If I'm hungry, I'd like a little food in my belly. I'd like somebody to hug me if I've never felt a warm embrace from someone who didn't want to get something from me through a touch. So when we think about who is our neighbor, it's our family and it's our friends. Our neighbor 
or Christians that sit across the church from us or worship at a house of the Lord across town or around the world. But it's also those in the world that are not believers that Jesus died to save too. And that's where Zambia comes in. You say, why Zambia? Why not? I mean, we got some work going on in Cuba, El Salvador, got some work going on up in Alaska. I'm always open to work anywhere, even locally. We got a lot of work going on locally. But when an opportunity comes before you and God cracks a door open, I'm a believer that you ought to take advantage of it. And it seems as though our Lord has cracked the door for us to be able to do a work in Zambia. Don't know exactly what it'll look like yet, but I know that in this room and in this church, there are some people that need to go. We need to go as as passionately to them as we've sent people to Cuba and El Salvador and to Alaska and to Montana and to Denver and to New York City and to neighborhoods right around our church. You say, but preacher, it's so far away. Is it even safe? How much does it cost? It is far away, but we need to go as far as we need to to bring the gospel close to those that need to hear it. Is it safe? The gospel is never safe. Now, physically, you're fine, but spiritually, there'll be a spiritual war that'll wage against you if you commit to go. Because the devil doesn't want you to serve Jesus on mission anywhere in the world, not even in Marion. How much will it cost? Doesn't matter. Because if we're called to go, we can't afford not to go. So who's your neighbor? Who is it that the Lord is speaking to you about this morning and saying, you need to treat them as you would want to be treated? Is it your parents? Is it your children? Is it a brother, a literal brother or sister? Is there a friend that you've fallen out with and, and you need to mend that relationship and bring that back into wholeness? Is it other believers that you've been talking about but not praying for or that you've been condemning rather than consoling? Or is it people around the world? Is it easy to hate the Chinese or the Russian or anyone else in the world? When Jesus has called us as Christians to not be like the world, but to love as ourself. Who is your neighbor? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we need you to Send your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts. Because our humanity, our natural humanity just loves to draw dividing lines. We like to compare ourselves over and against other people and make judgments because they don't look like us. They weigh more than us. They don't have enough money like we do. Maybe they dress differently. They talk differently, worship differently, or live in a different place. And Lord, what I need and ask you to do today is through the hands of the Holy Spirit to grab a hold of our heart. Because God, we confess to you this morning that it is not natural for us to love other people. But we also confess and acknowledge today that that's exactly what you've called us to do. So here we stand between the will of ourself and the will of our Savior. And I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you help us yield our will, our natural inclinations to the will of the Savior. For some in that, for some in this room, Lord, that might mean that they need to begin praying about their involvement in a greater mission work. For some, they need to get out of this house and make a phone call to a loved one and start mending a relationship. Whatever it is, Lord, can you break down our stubbornness, our hard-heartedness? Can you break down our selfish will? 
and buckle our knees to obedience to you. Today, what we want to hear you say, Lord, is go and do likewise. This morning, as we have our time of invitation, I want to invite you to be responsive to what the Lord might be saying on your heart. He might be giving you a specific face of someone that you need to mend a relationship with. During our invitation, you need to be obedient to tell the Lord that you're going to follow through with that when you leave this building. You're not going to leave that sense of, uh, of responsibility in this room. So prayerfully, right where you're sitting, you need to say, Lord, that face that I'm seeing or that name that's coming to my mind, I'm going to commit to you to follow through and do my part, go my mile in mending this relationship to reestablish a relationship of neighbor. For some of you, you might need to repent today for not loving other believers as Christ has loved us. However that looks in your life, you might need to just surrender that confession to him. You don't need to come forward to one of our prayer partners, but you can just surrender it to him and say, Lord, help me not to be judgmental. Help me not to be giddy at someone else's dis, uh, disfortune, misfortune. But Lord, you help me to see them as you see them and love them as you love them and treat them as I want to be treated. So right where you're sitting in a moment or right where you're going to be standing, you can do that. Some of you, some of you might need to make a commitment to really pray about mission. You know, in our church, there's a core of people that are just passionate about mission. And then there's a vast majority of you that, for reasons I don't know, you haven't told and I haven't asked, you've never gone. Maybe today you hear the Lord saying, it's time to change that. It's time to go and do likewise. So as we go into our time of decision, that might be your prayer. A prayer of commitment to truly be open-minded about the opportunities God puts before our church. Now, everything I've talked about today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian, you can set all of that aside and you can just hear this one thing. If you're not a follower of Christ, you don't have a neighbor. But you can leave here with a world full of them. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead to cancel and kill the payment of sin, and to give evidence of eternal life. And through your faith in his death and resurrection, you can become a believer. The moment you do, you inherit a whole kingdom of neighbors, a whole kingdom of family believers, and the teachings of Jesus then begin to apply to your life too. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, in a moment when we begin to sing, I want you to step out from where you're sitting and come to one of our prayer partners, or I'll be down here at the front as well, and just say, you know what, I, I need to accept Christ as my Savior. We'll know what to do from there. Or maybe you need to get baptized. We can set a date for that in the future. Or maybe you want to join our church. Discovery class is not going to be for a while. Maybe you want to go ahead and seal the deal and join our church. You can come forward during this time of decision tell one of our prayer partners that you'd like to join this family of faith. Father, whatever decision you lay upon the hearts of your people today, I want you to bind Satan from discouraging us to be faithful to make those decisions and pour out your Holy Spirit upon us to move us closer to obedience to your will. Whether it's joining the church, salvation, or a decision of commitment to follow through with what you're leading us to do, Lord, this is the time that we ask you to, to squeeze us tight and give us the courage to make these decisions. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I want you to stand with me. And as we get ready to sing, I don't want you to wait for somebody else to move. Today, you might be the one to start a great invitation for the Lord.
week out from vacation Bible school. You can go ahead and be seated. Here's what I want you to do this week. Anytime this week, when you drive by our church, I want you to say a prayer for the children that will come through the doors of our church for vacation Bible school. Pray for the children, their parents, their grandparents, whoever might be bringing them. Because we have an opportunity to impact these kids, maybe forever. Like me, you might be able to remember as a child, seven, eight years old, going to Bible school, doing a craft, eating butter cookies and watered down Kool-Aid, <laughs> hearing a Bible story with the felt board. You know what I'm talking about? For those of you that are older. But it made an impression on you, just like it made an impression on me. And so we've got teachers signed up and we've got volunteers in place and we've got security that's going to be here. Uh, But what we need is we need the prayer covering. So just, you don't have to look, I'm not asking you to make a note and put it on your refrigerator, but in your travels and you will this week ride by the church in the curve. And when you do, and you see that uh, great BVS banner that's up there, just say, Lord, don't close your eyes now if you're driving. Lord, I pray for our Bible school. I pray for our teachers. I pray for the kids that are going to be here that hear the gospel. I pray for their families that we can impact them with the hope of Jesus Christ. And look, and by that prayer, you'll be around the curve safely. But if you do that every time you drive by and our church family is faithful, we'll be covering this VBS. It'll be the greatest VBS that we've had in a long time. So let's make a commitment to do that. We've got some other things going on in the life of our church. Let's look at the video that tells us all about them. So much for joining us today. God is at work here at First Mary, and we wanted to share just a few ways that you and your family can get plugged in. Here is this week's Need to Know. Attention students, join us for a pool party and cookout on Sunday, June 25th from 4.30 to 6.30 at the Dudes. Please bring a dessert and a two liter soda. Hot dogs, hamburgers, and chips will be provided. Come hang out with Chris, our new youth pastor, and mark your calendars and join us on June 25th. Pastor James is taking signups for the traveling half day camps happening every afternoon after the close of VBS. The cost is $75. We have limited spots, so sign up now. Scan the QR code on the screen or just stop by the church office to sign up. We hope to see you at Traveling Half Day Camps. Attention kids, VBS registration is now open. The dates are June 19th through the 23rd from 8.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. each day. If you're a kid in grades K through 6, make sure to sign up today. Simply visit firstmarion.org slash VBS or scan the QR code or stop by the church office. We hope to see you at VBS 2023. It's going to be amazing. Get excited, church family. Jubilation Jazz will be with us on Sunday morning, July 2nd for a spectacular Independence Day celebration. Join us for an unbelievable worship experience with Wally and the band. You will not want to miss it. First Marion family, thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing here at our church. On your way out, be sure and grab a newsletter from the Connection Desk. And don't forget to check your emails for updates on what's happening here at First Marion. Join us next Sunday morning right here at 1030 for another amazing time of worship and fellowship. First Marion family, Have a great week sharing and showing the love of Jesus.